Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Okay. Welcome to this Simply Service session devoted to digitalization and logistic resilience, lessons learned from COVID-19 and the challenges ahead. I'm Rosie Zhang, Councillor of the Trading Services and the Investment Division of the WTO. Responsible for logistic services in the division, I'm honored to moderate this webinar. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the critical role played by logistic services and brought digitalization to the fore. Accelerated digitalization and its role in strengthening logistics and the supply chain resilience is also one of the critical issues in post-COVID recovery. As digitalization is accelerating and expanding, various challenges lie ahead for the logistic industry. On the other hand, many issues raised in trade negotiations, such as paperless trading, market access, interoperability, digital platforms are all crucial for the future of logistic industry. More clarity on how digitalization is transforming logistic services and where new challenges may arise would be valuable for policymaking as government are promoting digitalization and at the same time, strengthening logistic resilience. We are very fortunate that today we have speakers. They are all experts from the logistic industry covering express delivery. We have Mr. Carlos Grau Tanner, Director General of the Global Express Association, and Mr. Amgad uh, Shihata, Senior Vice President of UPS. And the freight forwarding, we have Dr. Uh, Stefan Graber, Director General of the International Federation of Freight Forwarders Association, and Mr. Aperon Guler, representing the Associ Association of International Freight Forwarding and the Logistic Services Provider of Turkey. And we also have representative from Alibaba to talk about e-commerce related logistics and port operation. We are lucky to have Mr. Martin Thiessen uh, to, from Port of Rotterdam. And last but not least, we have Ms. Hannah Ngurian, Deputy Representative of Digital Standards Initiative of International Chamber of Commerce. We are looking forward to having their insights about what lessons the logistic industry have learned from COVID and what they view the challenges lie ahead and what kind of policies that can help address those challenges. The WTO attaches great importance to logistic services our Deputy Director General, Ms. Gonzalez, recorded her opening remarks before heading for Washington DC together with our DG. Here are her remarks. Dear distinguished speakers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this seminar. The subject of today's seminar is timely and highly important for post-COVID economic recovery and global trade. The critical role of logistic services in trade and economic development can never be overemphasized. As trade is more and more organized through value chains, be it global or regional, logistic services are the glue that holds value chains together. Numerous studies have shown that a country's competitiveness highly correlates with its logistics performance, which relies on not only infrastructure, so-called hardware, but also software, namely the ability to supply cost-effective logistics service, services and the enabling environment. This is particularly important for developing countries as their logistics services are usually underperforming and LDCs suffer most from logistics constraints. Developing countries urgently need to improve their logistics capacity in the pursuit of development goals. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted again that logistics is the lifeblood of economies. It was international logistics operations from transport, storage, distribution to delivery that kept smooth cross-border flows of medical supplies, food, and other essential goods 
when most of the world was in lockdown during the pandemic. Thanks to the efforts of logistics providers, now every day millions of COVID vaccines are transported and delivered to all over the world to save people's lives. No need to mention that the production of vaccines also relies on the transportation and delivery of inputs sourced globally. The unprecedented pandemic has also brought digitalization of logistics services to the front as a result of COVID-19 restrictions and explosion of e-commerce. If traditional economic incentives were not enough for the logistics sector to transition to a digital form, COVID-19 has made such a transformation virtually inevitable. The pandemic has largely accelerated digitalization in the logistics services. To address deepened complexity and increased uncertainty in business, digitalization is now seen as a must for any logistics operation and supply chain management. For example, the quick deployment of Internet of Things allows better track and trace shipment and enables the rapid exchange of information between all parties involved along a supply chain. The building of logistics resilience in post-COVID uh, recovery cannot do without embracing automation and digitalization. As digitalization is accelerating and expanding, various challenges lie ahead for the logistics industry, such as trade protectionism, new regulatory environment, cybersecurity, unintended fragmentation, and lack of interoperability between the systems platforms of stakeholders, just to name a few. Logistics services providers are also under tremendous pressure to meet customers' ever-increasing demand. For example, the world is expecting a quick solution to supply chain bottlenecks such as rising shipping rates, container storage, port congestions, which are also some of the serious consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the importance of logistics services in trade and economy, Policymaking should be informed of the digital transformation and the challenges facing the logistics industry. Many issues covered in ongoing trade negotiations within and outside of the WTO, such as paperless trade, market access interoperability, digital platforms, and others, are all crucial for the future of the logistics industry. Policymakers would appreciate having more clarity on how digitalization is transforming logistics services and where new challenges arise as governments are promoting digitalization and at the same time strengthening logistics resilience. The speakers of today's seminar are all experts from the logistics industry covering express delivery, freight forwarding, e-commerce logistics, port operation, and digital standards. They will share experiences and exchange views on what lessons have been learned from COVID-19, what challenges lie ahead, and what kind of policies can help address those challenges. Information on the ground and insights from the business are always valuable and inspiring for our work in the WTO. I want to thank all of the speakers for your support. Finally, I wish you an informative and enlightening seminar, and we will continue to have more conversations in the WTO around these topics. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite the distinguished speakers to give presentations. Uh, and to audience, please use Q&A function to raise questions. After all the presentations, we will invite the speakers to address the questions. Our first speaker is Mr. Carlos Tanner, Director General of Global Express Association. Carlos has rich experiences in express delivery and air transport. Uh, personally, I always enjoy Carlos' insightful and highly interesting presentations. Carlos, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Rosie, and, and, and thank you, Annabelle, for inviting us to this important and indeed very timely seminar. The WTO is about to have a ministerial conference in, in a month's time. And what I'd like to do today is to, first of all, draw lessons from the pandemic from the point of view of the express delivery industry, and then to the extent possible, translate that into policy actions that hopefully WTO members could take at MC12 in a month's time. Um, and now comes the moment of truth when I try to share my screen. Let me see if I manage. Can you see the slides? Perfect, thank you. So, um, the subject of, of, the, of today's discussion is digitalization and logistics resilience, lessons learned. I would add also uh, a shopping list for policymakers, if you will. 
Uh, we are the Global Express Association, a trade association that represents the three leading express delivery carriers, uh, DHL Express, FedEx Express, and UPS. Uh, our business is to carry goods from one doorstep in the world to another safely, securely, and very fast. So I always like to describe this business as the conveyor belt of international trade, one of them at least, certainly the fastest uh, one as far as goods are concerned. Now, as Annabel was saying, uh, COVID-19 has exposed the vital importance of logistics. Uh, frequently, logistics is a business that happens in the background and, and the public is not necessarily exposed to it. But with, with uh, COVID, it, it's come to the fore. The pandemic has shed light on the vital importance of logistics. And here, vital is a term that is certainly not abused. It's not an exaggeration. It was vital to connect uh, manufacturers of, of critical medical equipment uh, and uh, now vaccines to hospitals uh, around the world. During the pandemic, express delivery showed to be a very resilient business. Now, was it easy? No. Operations continued worldwide, yes, but our supply chains, our networks were disrupted by a number of problems. At the beginning of the pandemic, we witnessed land border crossings, which affected our ability to truck goods across borders, and in some cases, complete airport closures. Uh, even the, civil in the International Civil Aviation Organization had to issue a call to governments around the world to keep cargo operations going for the reasons I just explained. We also uh, were affected by, uh, particularly our, our cargo crew, our pilots, by uh, curfews, quarantines and travel bans. And again, uh, special measures such as public health corridors had to be put in place to make sure that pilots could fly in and fly out uh, as smoothly as possible. We also witnessed inland transport restrictions, like for instance, the countries in which we were told we could only deliver between say eight, and eight in the morning and, and noon or only in certain zip code areas. You know, District 1 is fine, but District 2 is off limits. That all affected uh, the efficiency of the network. And perhaps the most important lesson was the problems faced with paper-based processes at the borders. Countries that had paper-based processes that required the presence of officials at the border to clear goods were particularly affected because in some cases, if say public transport networks were down, if buses were not running, they couldn't travel to their posts at the airport. And therefore the paper could not be cleared and the goods could not be cleared. They had to find alternative ways of doing that. Which takes me to one of the first points about the World Trade Organization. If you ever wanted a proof of concept of the benefits of the trade facilitation agreement, that was it. Trade facilitation matters and the implementation of the trade facilitation agreement matters particularly. Countries that had better border processes that were better aligned with the standards of the trade facilitation agreement showed more resilience. Things flowed better across the border. Hospitals received the things on time. Where uh, electronic processes were put in place, but not completely, where you had hybrid models, which still required, to some extent, paper-based processes, that didn't work well. So uh, the, we even saw instances where there, were, where there was full implementation of the trade facilitation agreement for the importation of vaccines. And the question is, if it can be done for the importation of vaccines, why cannot it be done for everything else? where there is a will, there is a way, and that proved it again. So message to the members of the World Trade Organization, it is time to accelerate the implementation of the Trade Facilitation Agreement to bring more resilience to international supply chains. Um, many of the key articles on digitalization are so-called best practices uh, in, in trade language. It's where it says to the extent possible, uh, if appropriate, and so on, but they're not hard obligations. Well, that was negotiated in 2015, 2016. The pandemic has completely changed uh, the landscape. It's time to treat those obligations as hard obligations and digitalize borders as quickly as possible. Now, another thing that is very important in the WTO is the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And logistics is certainly a service. We are service providers to people who 
trade in goods and to people who trade in services. But logistics is a bundle of services. And the way uh, the schedules operate in the WTO is through CPC classification codes. So when you speak about uh, express delivery, what comes to mind is courier services, 7512 if you, if you want the code. Well, yes, of course that's part of it, but in, in today's world, in order to run efficient logistics, you need a bundle of other services that need to be scheduled together. For instance, you need road transport services. I spoke about the importance of trucking uh, goods as part of our multimodal chain, whether it is uh, across borders or inland. Uh, freight transportation. You also need cargo handling services. Can uh, our staff handle the arrival of one of our planes and unload it? Or do we need to give it to someone else that we haven't necessarily trained it, it ourselves? It, 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 it creates friction in the system. Very importantly, storage. And if uh, something showed the importance of storage was the distribution of vaccines. Suddenly, uh, cold storage was an issue. Uh, well, we do offer cold storage services, but can we offer that services everywhere in the world? Um, I'm not suggesting that's the only reason for the lack of cold storage in many places, but it certainly is one of the reasons where countries haven't opened their market access to those who can provide cold storage services and train the people who run the facilities. Freight transport agency services and others that I will not cover here are part of that. But the important message here is it's important to open up a negotiation on market access to services, and that's a bundle, not this one, pick one, pick the other. It's not cherry picking, it's everything together. Last but not least, although we do not provide those services, we do depend on cross-border data flows. Digital borders require our ability, and we are pioneers in providing lots of information together uh, with the flow of physical goods, but in order for us to transmit it, to the border authorities and for them to be able to uh, collect that information and process it, IT services and telecom services are very important. So again, the importance of negotiating uh, more openness in services under the GATS is something that logistics really underlines. Now, let me move for one second outside the World Trade Organization uh, and look at the world of air traffic rights, the ability for a company to fly a plane between one country and another. This is not in the GATS, it's part of the International Civil Aviation Organization's remit. But again here, there was a proof of concept uh, in, in the pandemic. What I'm showing you here is a snapshot of the North Atlantic uh, around midnight European time uh, on January 15th, 2020, just before the pandemic uh, hit or the first wave. The next picture, is the same area exactly three months later during the first wave of the pandemic. As you can see, a lot of traffic has simply vanished. So who is left? Freighters, whether they are traditional freighters or express delivery freighters, passenger planes and the cargo they carry had simply disappeared because borders were being closed to passenger traffic to avoid the spread of the, of the uh, pandemic. But Cargo continued, cargo was resilient, and this proves that cargo is a completely different business model from passenger uh, flying. So what we are asking the International Civil Aviation this week as they hold a high level conference on COVID-19 is to really consider splitting the regulatory regime and creating a very open, distinct and flexible regime for traffic rights for all cargo operations, for freighter planes. That is one of the key lessons we've seen from the pandemic, in our opinion. Back quickly to the WTO. One of the uh, plurilateral agreements that will be before the ministerial is one on domestic regulation, or if you will, licensing. What kind of conditions do you have to meet uh, to get a license to operate your service? And uh, in many countries, express delivery is subject to licensing by the authorities. Uh, the, agreement that is before a group of members of the WTO is about having transparent and open licensing regimes, if they are deemed necessary, and an independent regulator. And I cannot stress enough the importance of adopting this because uh, express delivery is facing increasing regulatory burdens, particularly in Africa, but going beyond Africa now, starting to spread into Southeast Asia, where um, 
we are seen, frankly, as cash cows. And the, the conditions for obtaining a license are getting very, very draconian with uh, prohibitive fees or by granting new monopolies to the post office and then having to get a license from them. This would send a very strong signal that this is not all right and that parallel to opening the market for access, uh, market access for services, you need a strong and transparent and open domestic regulation licensing regime. So we hope that MC12 will be able to adopt that. So message to regulators to sum up, please accelerate the implementation of the trade facilitation implement uh, of agreement. Please take the digital aspects of the TFA into consideration, not as best endeavors, but as real obligations. Open up market access for services under the GATS, adopt a strong domestic regulation plurilateral, and for the civil aviation authorities and ministries of transport under the civil aviation organization, liberalize all cargo air services. That's it for me. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions uh, after the panel. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your always uh, in informative and straight to the point presentation. Uh, now, next, we are pleased to have Mr. Amgad, um, uh, the senior vice president of uh, UPS. With, uh, he will tell us some specific examples of UPS during the COVID. Amgad, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you, Rosie, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, you know, I, uh, I only was given two minutes. I think it's because uh, we're literally where the rubber hits the road in regards to this. And I was uh, asked to give uh, specific examples in a couple of minutes of what we have lived through. And here's what I was going to, you know, just tell you. It's really in three areas, what we've experienced and how we tie that back to policy and the WTO. As everybody isolated and, and, and stayed at home and social distance, our people, almost like firemen, you know, run into the fire, right? So everybody isolates and, and we were relied on to deliver uh, on global commerce and, and continue our networks up and running and make sure that uh, not only PPEs uh, are delivered, but everything else that's ordered. And then ultimately all the ingredients that went in uh, to cook uh, the vaccine. So layers and layers and layers of volume and connectivity. And what we learned are really the three things. And, and I'm just going to expand on what uh, um, Carlos talked about, customs and trade facilitation, uh, essential uh, employees, airline crew, the movement of airline crew in our networks, and then really the, the, the market access opportunities and the inefficiencies that exist. Um, from a trade facilitation standpoint, we saw authorities lock down their borders. Uh, employees didn't show up at borders because of um, quarantine. Uh, so everything shifted very quickly uh, in many countries to digital uh, and paperless. Um, and we were able to clear goods remotely uh, through those employees. And in most cases, um, it worked. So I guess lesson number one, uh, very quickly, the world figured out within 30 days, how to go digital, how to uh, clear remotely, uh, how to uh, redeploy resources, uh, government resources on high risk items. So if we've done it during the pandemic and we were able to pivot, let's figure out how to enshrine that and actually do it moving forward. So to Carlos's point, uh, many of the, the TFA um, elements are self, uh, um, implemented or as best endeavor, uh, we're asking for a higher threshold, a stronger commitment, and we want to help on how to get there. So that, that's number one. From an airline crew standpoint, um, what had happened during the pandemic for uh, some of our teams is there was a patchwork of, um, of isolations. In other words, uh, some countries said you need to do this in a closed loop setting in regards to um, staying on airport grounds or staying in certain quarantine hotels. You can turn around crew within 24 hours. Um, the beauty of our networks and the global stress uh, industry is really, it's all about a, a, a two-way uh, street. So um, 
our experience has been though there wasn't consistency and the patchwork of how we had to comply by the, some of these procedures created significant uh, inefficiencies, which ended up creating either sometimes stranded crew in countries or stranded volume in countries. And this is because it was a really fast jump ball, right? Like many had to react, many governments had to react very quickly. So lesson learned is we have an opportunity now to take and look at a global protocol that's a unified protocol that has common sense in regards to how we treat essential workers and the connectivity that exists in these networks. It's always about the network in the global express and logistics industry. It's about connectivity. And then um, lastly, I, I wanted to say from an economic recovery standpoint, um, you know, as we all know, many businesses and small businesses had to shut down or were helped uh, by government. So there was a significant amount of uh, financial resources uh, put into SMEs. Some survived and some didn't. I think from an economic recovery standpoint, and I think we've all learned what logistics and distribution has done to keep everybody moving through the pandemic, we really need to focus on uh, fostering and reinforcement of how do we help SMEs build back better. And in specifics, uh, from a gender-based standpoint, uh, I heard a statistic the other week that the negative impact uh, of the pandemic on uh, women-owned businesses and women in general is equal to about 83 countries worth of GDP. So we really need to focus on how do we leverage um, the, the, the logistics and express uh, delivery services and the networks that we provide. And we're doing that um, in reality, UPS is. And how do we do that in a, in a way that helps SMEs connect to global value and supply chain? So thank you very much for the, the five minutes I was given. And uh, I, I truly appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Amgad, for sharing with us your insights and information on the ground. I think that will help us better understand the real world of logistics. Um, have you heard from uh, enlightening presentations about express delivery? Let's turn to freight forwarding, another important part of logistic services. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Uh, Stefan uh, Graber, uh, the Director General of Fiat. Before joining Fiat, Dr. Graber was Secretary General at the U uh, Swiss Trading and the Shipping Association, the National Trade Association for Commodity Trading, shipping industry and the trade finance in Switzerland. He was also chair and the CEO of EGTSA, a company that successfully developed a digital communication platform for commodity trading companies and the commodity trade financing banks. Um, Dr. Graber ob obtained a PhD in business administration. Okay, um, so now the floor is yours, Dr. Graber. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Let me share my screen. Does it work? It is true. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, let me start first by just introducing uh, Fiata. So Fiata is. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Graber, your sound is not very good. My sound. Okay. If I speak a little bit louder, is it better? Now it's much better. I think you, you may have to be closer to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> so um, let me just introduce first uh, Fiata. Uh, so it's the global voice of freight forward in the logistic industry. It's representing uh, 100 uh, freight forwarders in more than 150 countries, composed of association members in 109 countries, and uh, that represent themselves for more than 4,000 freight uh, forwarding uh, and logistics firms. Um, we also have direct companies, member at FIATA, the uh, national association that represent 5,500. So I think I, I joined uh, the, the comments that were done before uh, by, by Carlos and uh, so uh, the, the second presentation we had. Uh, we need and we were committed 
uh, to promote the trade facilitation agreement. I will come back to that. And also best practices among the free forwarding community that was very key uh, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We also think that it's time to give priority uh, to ensure business recovery. We, I will come back to that, but we will see that there are a lot of uh, bottlenecks and issues we are encountering now. And uh, we need really to build a more resilient and sustainable uh, supply chain for the future. So the critical role of trade forwarders, uh, they are often called the architects of trade as they bring together uh, the different actors in the, in the supply chain uh, that is very fragmented and whether that be road, rail, sea or air. Freight forwarders are generally characterized by their flexibility and agility on service, price, and deliveries. Uh, they also bring to their customer the understanding of the global and do domestic regulatory requirements. Uh, with the increasing cost now of e-commerce, what we observe is a shift from the traditional B2B to the B2C, so business to consumer, uh, and uh, it's clear that the e-commerce component is probably one of the, 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 the things that has really accelerated a lot during the, the COVID pandemic. And that also creates some of the, of the issue the supply chain has today in order to uh, be uh, more resilient. So FIADA has extensively advocated for the recognition of free forward as, as essential services during the pandemic. That was something that was developed by Carlos, so I, I completely subscribe to him. Uh, it was very key uh, that uh, the, the supply chain could function during the, the pandemic, and uh, that was possible only by uh, having the, the different actors of this supply chain being recognized as essential services. So the COVID-19 has also revealed the essential role of logistics that was highlighted before, and uh, also the, uh, provided a better understanding by the authorities and the governments of the key economic uh, of this key economic activity, and I think that it really represents today uh, a big chance to address some of the inefficiencies of the supply chain because the pandemic also proved the uh, vulnerabilities of the supply chain, and uh, we. Because now there is a better understanding and interest for the supply chain, there is a possibility to work together with governments uh, at uh, addressing these inefficiencies and trying to uh, have a better supply chain, more resilient, and to prepare also for uh, the future and unfortunately may, maybe for another uh, crisis. Uh, so, so there are a lot of things here that we can do together and we should use the momentum we have. So I, I, I listed here a few of the vulnerabilities in the maritime sector. We are having a, a very unique situation now with uh, container imbalances, bank sailing, abandoned cargo, port and terminals congestions uh, that all severely impacted the maritime transport and uh, resulting in the situation we observed uh, now. We have the air freight with a rapid downturn during the pandemic uh, in air freight capability that has uh, completely challenged the just-in-time uh, freight movements model that we had until then. Uh, on the road, it was uh, explained before the difficulties that uh, with drivers shortages uh, that impacted the road transport and here uh, the, the legislation in certain countries were even increasing this, uh, this issue. A general need also for further harmonization and simplification of the supply chain uh, is really one of the, the, the key message we can take from this uh, crisis. So what uh, FIATA does uh, and one of the challenge revealed by the, the pandemic is certainly the digitization of the supply chain. And the, the COVID has, has played a role as a catalyzer in the recognition for the need of to digitalize the supply chain and to, uh, to move from a, an industry that is very much traditionally paper-based to uh, a, a less paper-based, so more a paperless industry. And that's also a point that was uh, raised by Carlos before. So by digitalizing and going paperless, 
there is a, a real opportunity here to address certain of the inefficiencies in the supply chain. And by the same time, also to address some of the question of sustainability the world has to face today. So while we see that tools exist today, they are still not used globally. And the challenge is really about the implementation. Uh, that's one of the main reasons why when Fiat uh, worked uh, on this, we were looking at involving all the actors and uh, uh, really focusing on interoperability because what we noticed is that what is missing is really interoperability, the possibility to exchange uh, the relevant data between the, the different stakeholders. And that's really what has uh, driven our Fiat Digital Strategy that we launched uh, in June 2020, middle of the pandemic. Uh, the strategy, as said, is focused on interoperability and collaboration with all actors of the supply chain. So the core of the Fiat Strategy is to digitalize uh, one of its uh, very important uh, documents, that is the Fiat uh, Bill of Lading. It is the only true multimodal uh, transport document that is negotiable and uh, endorsed by uh, and ICC rules. Uh, our concern at FIATA when digitaliz digitalizing the, the BL, uh, the Bill of Lading, was to reinforce the security and the traceability of this document. And uh, it was mentioned in the introduction the issue of uh, cybercrime. And, uh, and effectively today, uh, also on this paper, uh, you always are very uh, exposed to fraud. So one of the objectives we had is how can we reinforce the security and the traceability of this document? The second point was to provide a document that is interoperable and allows data exchange with all the stakeholders in the supply chain. Uh, we finished this summer uh, the, successfully the proof of concept uh, with seven major uh, software providers and uh, 19 freight forwarding companies. Uh, we expect to start the implementation of this document early 2022. And we are already envisaging also some uh, possible extension of the documents uh, for the future. At FIATA, we are aware of the current legal constraint that exists for the adoption of the digitalized digital document uh, in comparison to a paper one. And that's why what we also did in order to, to ensure that uh, this document and this e-document be uh, easily adopted is to always allow the possibility to uh, move to paper. So, and this without losing the benefits of using the EFBL, the, the electronic theater bill of lading. So it's clear that in parallel, we are working closely with all the actors and uh, we will have a presentation of the ICC just uh, after, sometime after me, that uh, on the development and adoption of the relevant standards to facilitate the use and acceptance of electronic bills of lading worldwide, but we are also conscious that this is not the case today. And today we are uh, restricted because we don't have this legal uh, framework in place that really facilitate the adoption of uh, pure electronic uh, documents and exchange of data so that we could get rid, rid completely of documents. So, what we did for the time being is that we, we tried to adapt to this situation and to allow that the document could be at any time, if required, uh, moved to paper so that uh, it can be used. But that's probably not uh, very satisfactory in order, in order to face the, the, the future uh, of uh, electronic uh, supply chain. So as a conclusion, I, I would like to highlight the need for, the, for having a level playing field and for a harmonized uh, global approach to support the economic recovery. It starts, and that was uh, also mentioned before, by the effective implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. Uh, it's absolutely key. We noticed that there are uh, very much differences from one country to the others, and it's really important now 
uh, to uh, work on these differences and to try to implement and reinforce uh, the WTO trade facilitation agreement. The second aspect is the recognition of electronic transferable documents through the development of the legal framework of digitalization uh, of the supply chain, such as, for example, the NMTR. Um, it's really today important and the challenge ahead of us to ensure that we have a secure, a sustainable, and a digitalized supply chain is huge. It requires that all the actors and the governments work together to make it a success. It has never been so urgent. So we also see that we never had such an opportunity to do it because the people and everyone is waiting today that the supply chain uh, can deliver uh, uh, in, in, a, in a smooth way. And we see how uh, it was uh, disrupted by the, the COVID pandemic, even if the actors did all their best to, to continue to move goods during this period. So it's really a call for working together, all the actors and the, the governments in order to make it happen. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take uh, discussion uh, questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graber, for your excellent presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. William Shun, uh, the chief strategist um, of, of China, the logistic arm of Alibaba. Um, we have witnessed uh, the boom of e-commerce in the recent years, uh, which has also generated new players in the logistic industry with new business model. Amazon and Alibaba are the two typical examples in this regard. So today we are very fortunate to have um, Mr. Shung with us today to inform us of the activities his enterprise is undertaking. In Alibaba, Mr. Shung is uh, responsible for establishing global smart logistic network, strategic blending, and the supply chain innovation. He has over 18 years experience in strategy development and the transformation in global logistic and the supply chain. Mr. Shun, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Um, it's my pleasure to attend on today's um, um, discussion. And my um, topic for sharing is really focusing on the digitization and also on the resilience. So first, um, Tanyao um, established um, eight years ago um, is a logistic arm for Alibaba Group. And today we have created a global network that is complete of our global parcel network, our global supply chain, and also our global freight networks. It provides an infrastructure that supports global merchants to sell um, to overseas consumers. With a global parcel network, we provide the global delivery at a very affordable cost, delivering to almost more than 200 countries. For global supply chain, it serves global brands to provide uh, global supply chain services uh, around the, the world. And for the global freight network, it helps um, the transportation for digitized B2B transactions. And we have the global logistics infrastructures with the e-hubs, uh, the air and ocean networks, the last mile sorting centers, locker poodles, which supports um, the global parcel network, global supply chain, and global freight network. So we are very encouraged to find with the increasing digitization, not only for the um, consumer uh, consumptions, but also for the global trade that has continuously shaping uh, the trade and consumption network. And we are providing 
uh, the global infrastructures to quickly support all those um, business opportunities and making sure that we can provide uh, a very affordable services uh, with the digital capabilities to serve our merchants and consumers. So besides of serving merchants and consumers, we also leverage our global network to provide the smart and stable solutions, especially during the pandemic. So from last year, Chaniao works with variable international associations and transport more than 250 million PPEs to over 150 countries. So we believe the resilient logistics network can provide and is providing a very critical supporting, especially in those difficult times. Um, interesting case is that, especially in the pandemic, that we have to quickly establish transportations to a lot of countries that traditionally are not that significant in a traditional trade environment. For example, we have to work very closely with some international associations to provide a very agile and quickly formed global logistics services for the vacancies. So here we demonstrate how we can quickly establish such a transportation from Beijing to Africa with a close cooperation in different processes of the whole transportation. We will quickly make those um, urgent demand possible, especially with a very digitally uh, monitoring process. In the pandemic, we further realized that a cost affordable and a resilient global logistics network is so crucial for merchants and for global consumers. So we launched a 10 day delivery for e-commerce parcels only at $5 transportation cost. With that services, now we provide to more than 200 key markets and enable that cross-border e-commerce logistics experience to be even more popular and more affordable. In addition to that, we are launching a 20-day deliveries, cost-saving transportation solutions only at $2. We believe in a lot of countries that can create a resilient solutions for a lot of consumers when they try to um, have a very affordable lifestyle, even at those difficult times. Technology is a key for how we can make these things happen. To the uh, left-hand side, we launch a lot of IoT devices, which support a significant efficiency improvement throughout our processes. We also enable digital te technologies to make sure that we can consolidate a consumer's orders to different merchants into a combined order, which can significantly improve the delivery efficiency and also reduce the cost. And we also create the end-to-end -end digital um, processes uh, that make sure both from a operations perspectives and from a route calculation and decision perspectives, and also from the last mile, very cost-effective unmanned solutions. All those solutions are particularly popular during the pandemic because these serves 
are more efficient, more environmental friendly, and and uh, more convenient solutions for the e-commerce. So with that, we believe the continuous service improvement and cost reduction can be possible. That not only can create a resilient products, but can create a resilient global service at an affordable cost. Last but not least is on our carbon peak and neutrality strategies. So we understand during the pandemic and also after the pandemic, we need to create a global solution that is good not only for the merchants, for the consumers, but also for the environment, for society. So we launched our carbon emission reduction initiatives. For example, in the last miles, um, when we launch our lockers, it can reduce the duplication um, deliveries by half. For our green logistics indi indicators, we not only um, use that to measure our green initiatives, but also create some standards and solutions for global logistics partners. We create a carbon account and carbon sink for merchants so that they can better understand their carbon footprint. And also we create different technologies to making sure that we not only capture, but also we encourage the consumers to select a more environmental friendly delivery methods. So with all this, we believe that we can work together with our um, close partners, not only to reduce our carbon footprint um, within our um, logistics and supply chain operations, but we can work very closely with consumers to encourage uh, more carbon effective and more green lifestyle. So we believe that can um, help um, our consumers and merchants to better contribute to the environment and to the society. So uh, that's it for my presentation. Uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shun, for your enlightening uh, presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Martin Thiessen, uh, ecosystem and platform play lead at the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, ports can constitute critical nodes in logistic networks. The pandemic has highlighted the strategic importance of ports uh, as indispensable links in supply chains. And the port of Rotterdam is one of the best ports in the world, also advanced in port automation and uh, digitalization. So uh, with import of Rotterdam, Martin is responsible for setting and activating the strategic digital agenda for the commercial departments. He coordinates and drives the digital commercial strategy and translates this into tangible objectives. I'm sure uh, Martin has a lot to share with, with us. Martin, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Let me check that I am unmuted and you can hear me. Yes, it's all set. So um, I do my screen. You can all see my screen now. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the, for the invitation, Roshi, and, and, and delighted to speak here a little bit on how we look at the world in, in this challenging time for facilitating trade, because in the end, that is, I think, the, the true reason of a board existence is that we we facilitate trade, uh, and we do that already for hundreds of years, starting starting in the early days with, with the simple cables and the hard infrastructure. Um, a little bit about the port of Rotterdam, biggest port in Europe. We are a landlord model port, so we provide the infrastructure, uh, and we lease out the land, and we collect port dues, provide safe passage via the harbor master, uh, and we leave basically the operations uh, and supply chain management to uh, to the market. 
So we really facilitate trade. And I think um, what we, where we see the, our role is that we really are looking to digital infrastructure as well. Traditional port, we have expanded our port into the sea. Um, so hard infrastructure is, is available, uh, should be sufficient for the coming decades. So the real reason where we now are expanding is into digital infrastructure, right? Same as a keyboard where a ship uh, docks and where goods are exchanged. We are looking into platforms or data and infrastructures where data is exchanged. Um, so we see that in the same layers as we see that in, in, in physical infrastructure, uh, where you have a data layer, everything that happens in the port, being it uh, our, our smart infra, where we, where, we, where we provide safety and security. Uh, we add technology to that, or the market technology to that, being it AI, being it blockchain, uh, other developments. And up until that, that's where our role stops. And that's where we leave it to the community and to the marketplace to develop services that, that will truly facilitate trade via Rotterdam. And um, I think what COVID showed us, and I'll go to the next slide, is uh, it was a development happening already, but, but COVID only expressed the need for it, is that we need to be very good at what we do in Rotterdam. So we have been doing this for, for a decade already with our port emergency systems working on, on efficient port calls. Uh, how, can we, how can we align intra-port modalities? So choosing between rail, barge uh, and truck, uh, and then put supply chain uh, planning around it uh, and adding it with smart infrastructure. Um, but that's only gonna add value if it is part of a global ecosystem of digital trade infrastructure, right? We can only be very efficient in Rotterdam if we know, if we talk the same language as the world, as we are, able to exchange data if we are interoperable. Um, so we really look at global trade as an ecosystem of players where we all have a, have a role to play. And if we play it well, then we can combine one and one into three instead of just defending our own piece of the pie, the traditional way of, uh, well, maybe not fully, completely politically direct, but the, the, the traditional way of logistics thinking, uh, where we now start sharing data and everybody can benefit. Um, I think COVID, uh, we have heard the examples from the freight forwarding industry. I have a background with, uh, with TNT Express. Um, very familiar. We also had that in the board, right, where containers were arriving from, for example, China, but the bills of lading were not even there yet because they were not able to be picked up at the factory in China because uh, they were in lockdown. Um, so it's, it was a really a mismatch between physical and, and, and paper, if you wish, or data supply chain, and it leads to really imbalances and we still face uh, the challenges of that. Uh, we had the Suez Canal incident. Uh, we have the mismatch in, in, uh, in, in uh, availability of equipment, which is still driving some issues in imports globally. Uh, and we all, if we start working together in an ecosystem and start exchanging, start exchanging data, um, then we can, that's the only way we can really fix it. Um, this is a rather important slide, I believe, or an important message. Uh, and it's, I'm echoing Stefan's uh, words here from the Fiada, where uh, we, we play at the bottom three levels, right? Uh, we look for standardization. We don't need more standards in the world, but we need to adopt the standards that are already there. In our case, on, on event and location data and port operations, um, so that at least we talk the same language and know where, what happens where uh, and when. And then we are able to, to share that data within the port system uh, within Rotterdam. But that's only gonna, gonna be of value if it's interoperable, if we are able to share that data uh, and distribute it globally. So we need to work together with our, with our data hubs globally, being it other ports, being it uh, other stakeholder players. And on top of that, then the market can, can do its business, can develop its services, uh, where we, of course, develop our own services for our own port of Rotterdam, being it, it, uh, it efficient port calls, but uh, most of that is really to the market, where we will not be a market player, just a, a supply chain facilitator. Um, this shows a little bit of how we look at the ecosystem. Uh, you see a lot of names here, it's, it's examples, it's definitely not limited, but that's also what it makes it so complex. Um, so we all need to work together here and being have our own data position. Uh, and that's where I think uh, ports have a major role to play going forward in, in working together uh, and be 
the, the, the role they have in the physical world also take that in the digital world as a neutral facilitator of trade, uh, providing data sharing infrastructure, um, talking to all these players here uh, and being interoperable so that trade flows around the world and data is available and EBLs are available and uh, uh, operational data is available, but also planning data. Um, we, we're talking about resilient supply chains. Um, and that's 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 to me it sort of imposes the fact that we want to go back to normal, right? Uh, but I should also we should consider maybe there is a new normal. And one thing that is uh, COVID has helped us uh, creating insight and urgent to is that there's one thing is going to be there from now on. Let's change, and we need to be able to respond rapidly. So I'm not so much uh, an advocate of resilient supply chains, but I want to or be an advocate of, of flexible uh, supply chains where you can access the data you need uh, at any given moment so you can change your supply chain accordingly. And of course, that requires uh, working together on all these, these stakeholder groups uh, and also the industry bodies like the WTO itself, and you see other names here as well, uh, where, we, where we need to embrace this given fact of uncertainty and, and look for the common denominator being at availability of data and the data sharing capability. And then I think the commercial parties of this world will be able to design really flexible and agile supply chains that, that can basically provide what we need in any moment, uh, given time. Um, I have one slide added, could just quickly just now, because Stefan mentioned it on the, on the Fiat side, on the EBL. And that's also where we are working closely together. This is one of the projects we're doing with, for example, Singapore. Um, in a consortium where we look into the uh, digital social instruments and then we take an EBL as an example and work together also with the government in the Netherlands to change, actually to change the law so that we can uh, accept digital digital documents uh, are as a legit form for a title transfer in this case. Uh, and these are, I think, crucial, crucial, crucial projects that no party in the supply chain can do on their own, but it needs all of these stakeholders work together and to come to an acceptance of a paper document that has been there for well since the middle ages since medieval times when we started doing trade globally it, it's still done that way and yes we can digitalize uh, a bill of lading and we can turn it back into paper when required but we need to change the system and we have to have we have ports to 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 adopt this way of working to to provide the digital infrastructure carriers need to adopt the ebl solutions that's the services part um, the, the, the trading platforms, the digital shippers and the forwarders, they need to work with that, but the industry bodies and the authorities also need to step up their game um, and really change the pace in which these new ways of working and these data-driven principles are adopted. And I think there, that's really where we, uh, where we need to work together. And uh, one of these sessions can definitely massively help because it only starts if we start talking each other's language and, and start to trust each other uh, more and more. Um, so it's a bit of a holistic way of viewing at the world. Um, hopefully, I, I understand the message that uh, ports of the future, in, in, in our opinion, uh, will play the same role as they do now, being a neutral facilitator of trade, uh, facilitating digital infrastructure, data sharing hubs, upon which everybody can connect, it's interoperable, and then the market can, can run its services. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, well, that's where you see the green shifts, right? It's a, uh, it's a loop because you can only provide data infrastructure uh, successfully if there are services develop on top of that. The more services you have, the more successful your, your platform will be and the other way around. So it's really a, an ecosystem for us uh, where we need to find each other and then start working on, on use cases. Uh, we have a few lined up, so I'm more than happy to share them in more detail at another stage. Um, and then definitely reaching out to WTO and the other the other participants here, I think, to discuss this topic and start to understand how we as sport can uh, even better do our play our role in the in the future. That's it for me for now. I would like to take some or to, to leave some time for questions. Uh, that's basically where we where we truly learn. Um, so hopefully it was interesting and uh, and always happy to share more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. I, I think it's very fascinating to look at the ecosystem uh, and, and, and that is, uh, I think, a lot of things we need to learn from you. 
Okay, uh, now let's turn to some national um, uh, experience. Um, we now have a lot of, uh, now so far we have heard um, basically representatives of um, big enterprises, uh, Port of Rotterdam, uh, UPS, um, and Alibaba. But how about uh, SMEs? Uh, uh, how about their experience in COVID-19 and also um, their experience in digitalization? So now our next speaker um, is Mr. Aperon Gula, uh, the Industry Affairs Manager of the Turkish uh, Association of International Forwarding and Logistics Service Providers. Uh, most of the members uh, of his association, they are SMAEs. So um, now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Gula, please. Thank you, Rosie. Um, I'll share my screen. Should be okay now. Firstly, I'd like to uh, thank you for thank the uh, WTO team for their invitation uh, to represent the Turkish logistics industry in this webinar. Um, in my presentation today, I will be telling the audience about the experience of Turkish logistics industry during COVID-19 pandemic and its implications for digitalization of the industry. Here is an outline of my presentation. First, I will briefly introduce you to cut. Later on, I will touch upon the experiences of the Turkish logistics industry during the pandemic. Here I will mainly talk about the restrictions and their implications for the industry in the first half of the previous year. Later on, I will summarize what we have learned in the process. I will go on with presenting you a project on which Uticat has been working on quite some time already. I have considered this presentation as an opportunity through which this project can be heard by a wider international audience. And I will end my presentation with a few remarks that can be considered as possible challenges, challenges for the effective implementation of the project. I start with UTICAD. It is an association of international forwarding and logistics service providers established in 1986. It has currently 536 members. The member base of UTICAD is quite diverse. It has members engaged in each mode of transportation. Among the members, there are freight forwarders, port operators, physical carriers, airlines, customs brokers, warehouse, warehouse operators, etc. All in all, it has members from every link of the logistics chain. Today, it is the most extensive and ex inclusive logistics association in Turkey. Here are the main activities of UTICAD captured in one page. The main purpose of UTICAD is to represent its members and their interests at various platforms, both national and international. PIATA, CLECAT, and UNECE are among the platforms of international representation. Ministries and related public bodies, together, together with other NGOs, are among areas of national representation. Aside from these, we have cooperations with various universities, associations, private bodies, as long as it serves to the interest of the Turkish logistics industry and our members, we establish cooperations with various actors. Social responsibility projects constitute another field in UTICAT's activities. For instance, UTICAT is a signatory of the UN's Global Compact Initiative. Lastly, vocational training is another area through which we support the industry. FIATA Diploma in Freight Forwarding Training is provided in Turkey only by UTICAT and Currently, we are working on the digital delivery of the program. This actually became a lesson we have learned during the pandemic. Our vocational training activities had, had to go through transformation to adjust the new normal. There are daily vocational training seminars we provide to the industry. We publish books, reports, and a three monthly bilingual UTCAT magazine. After this brief introduction of UTICAT, I would like to proceed with the main topics of my presentation. March 2020 and onwards, COVID-19 pandemic meant many restrictions in the logistics industry. First precaution the states have resorted to have been closing down the borders and Turkey was not an exception. Turkey has land borders with its neighbors at east-west direction and serves as a natural land bridge between Europe and Asia. 
the Bulgarian border crossing at the west, which serves as an important gate for transport towards European countries, has severely suffered from the restrictions. Long truck queues are actually a problem of pre-COVID times at this particular border crossing point. However, when combined with restrictions, it has been really difficult. Plus, the Turkish government has introduced 14-day quarantine to track, tra track drivers returning from abroad. A last problem to mention here is that the Turkish drivers need visa to transport goods, and because visa offices were closed and applications were not processed, the problem of visa renewals has only added to the severity of the problem. The border crossing with our eastern neighbor Iran was also closed and trucks had to reroute over Georgia. This practice has led to increased freight rates. With Iraq, on the other hand, a buffer zone has been created. Drivers drove the truck to buffer zones, left the vehicles, necessary precautions were taken and another driver continued the transport operations. Canceled flights have also contributed to the problem. There has been limited capacity with increased demand. Airlines have to convert their passenger aircrafts into freighters. We have seen freight boxes attached to passenger seats and we have witnessed the newly coined term freighter, a passenger plane acting as a freighter. In addition, blank sailings have also contributed to this all. Vessels skipping ports meant rising demerge costs, problems in connecting intermodal operations, and also problems in finding empty containers for export. In Turkish experience, rail transport emerged as a facilitator of contactless trade. At this point, please uh, bear in mind that the share of railroad, railroad transportation in Turkish foreign trade is less than 1%, both in value and weight. However, it worked with transports through Iran. Rather than pulling the cars, locomotives pushed the cars into Iranian border and they were later pulled by Iranian train operators. Whatever the consequences are, there is a need for someone to physically load the tracks, handle builds, inspect the containers and use the forklift. What I have been telling you are the mostly operational aspects of logistics industry during the first half of 2020. All in all, tra trade finds new ways and goods meet their customers. But there are also new elements in this process and these elements present themselves mostly as lessons which can be considered as takeaways from this experience. First lesson we have learned is that logistics industry is as significant as health industry. The delivery of everyday goods, food, personal protective equipment, medical equipment needs to be transported to where they are needed. These operations require expertise, planning, and proper execution of operations. The global rollout of vaccines is also no exception. Second lesson we have somehow learned through experience is that the Turkish logistics industry was somehow ready to continue its operations even when faced with uncertainty. Almost all logistics companies through the help of their individual digital systems managed to continue their op operations when the employees had to stay at home and work from distance. The industry proved itself to be a quick learner and it quickly adjusted itself to a new working envi environment. Another lesson is that you need alternatives, both for input for production and for markets. And this is very much valid from the logistics perspective as well. In, Tur in Turkey, it is possible to use each conventional mode of transportation. And in times like this, there is a great need for network capabilities of logistics companies. Restrictions and disruption in, of logistics services in one area led to search for alternatives. At this point, associations like Utica didn't remain isolated from what is happening in the industry. We have also transformed our working method and started to work from our homes. And actually we still continue to do so. And this proved to be much efficient instead of fighting the traffic for hours in a city such as Istanbul. Meetings started to be held online and we have experienced that it increased our level of interaction with our member base. Aside from these, we have also came up with recommendations on digitalization of delivery order processes instead of physical delivery of the documents. 
in search of ways to support the operations of our members, we have started to publish freight-related updates in our COVID-19 page. And up to today, we have published almost 1,000 updates from all around the world. One last thing I would like to bring up is that we have experienced signs of state-led digitalization in this process. We know that there is work going on, but in order to provide the uninterrupted flow of trade, the certificate of origin started to be digitally accepted by the customs. It somehow proved that future became today when faced with necessity. So far in my presentation, I have been telling you, uh, with, I have been providing you uh, information about the dis disruptions in logistics services and how small steps towards digitalization may help overcome these disruptions. In this part, I would like to briefly tell you about a project of Utikar. We believe that this, once goes live, will greatly contribute to logistic resilience in Turkey. We currently call it as Turkish Digital Logistics Platform. It is currently a work in progress by Utikar's Innovation Focus Group. It is designed to be a unifying platform for all digital platforms of all shareholders in logistics industry, including all modes of transportation. In this project, we have mapped every transaction, data entry, every approval process, and a concept report is finally put together. In short term, we plan to organize workshops in order to shape the project through the expectations of the representatives of the logistics industry. Later on, we will prepare a proof of concept. In short, the platform aims at bringing together public and private bodies involved in logistics processes. These can be the carrier, exporter, trade forwarder, customs authority, and other regulatory body, bodies, port management, financial institutions, and many others. Many of these bodies have their own digital systems, but they are in isolation from each other. For instance, the digital systems of the, the digital system of the customs authority is an example of what is called a data silo. Many different bodies enter and re-enter data, but it is not shared with related parties. The expected outcomes may seem rather generic, but a unifying digital, digital platform in logistics industry is expected to have the following benefits, such as increased productivity, increased visibility, capacity optimization, which can be, which can at a later phase lead into capacity sharing, data analysis, time saving, reduced transaction costs, quick interaction among parties. It looks good as a plan, but there are a few points which emerge as challenges to this project. Firstly, there is possibility of resistance from prospective users. In Turkey, the industry, I, I think this is the case for the whole world actually, the industry is largely composed of SMEs and companies of various size and scale can have different ideas and expectations of digital processes. A broad consensus is in the industry will be a significant, will be significant for the effective functioning of the project. Second, the project is rather ambitious. It aims to unify all parties of a transport operation under one digital roof. The fragmented structure of the wider ecosystem of logistics can also be seen as a challenge. Lastly, our experience showed us that states have rather a conservative position towards digitalization. COVID-19 pandemic was a turning point, but this may not prove, uh, this may not be sustainable in the future. Governments seem to have more trust towards paper-based documents rather than digital documents. And in this context also, I would like to bring up the different layers of digitalization. By experience, I know that sometimes a physically signed, stamped, and later scanned document sent as an email attachment is regarded as part of a digitalization process. It may be so, however, in the age of Internet of Things and smart sensors, it is not enough. There is a need for a shift of perception of digitalization, together with a clear understanding for the need of it. I would like to thank the audience for their patience. You can reach Utica through our webpage and social media channels. 
uh, social media ch channels. Thank you again for inviting Mitika to this valuable webinar. And if you have any questions, I'd like to, I, I will be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bula. Okay, um, our last but not least speaker is uh, Ms. Hannah Nguyen. I, I think, you know, there's, a, there's a, a several common topics um, brought up by our previous speakers. One is about paperless trading. Another is about uh, interoperability between uh, systems and platforms. So I think um, um, Hannah will uh, a lot to share with us their digital standard initiative, which will address this interoperability uh, issue. Okay, um, Hannah has a lot of experiences uh, also in digitalization um, and also logistic industry. Hannah, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Rosu, for the warm introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's my pleasure to contribute to this panel. My name is Hannah Nguyen from the Digital Standards Initiative at ICC. Um, so the Digital Standards Initiative is one of the latest efforts by the ICC to ensure that every business, regardless of size or sector, is able to exchange trade and supply chain data digitally across borders and stakeholders. And also doing that using any technology or solution of their choice with minimum cost and complexity. So I think this is a common vision that many of our panelists have shared. And so I'm very happy to be able to join this panel today. But to enable that move from paper um, to paperless, our work really focus a lot on standards harmonization. And the Northern Star is for different stakeholders, systems and processes to interoperate, which is also something that uh, a lot of our panelists have mentioned earlier. And uh, at ICC, we aim to do that uh, in partnership with others, seeking to reuse rather than recreate. And we have actually looked to the standard setting bodies as well as uh, industry associations, among others, FIATA, and various stakeholders um, to promote harmonization and adoption of existing standards. And where there may be gaps, uh, we will work with those that have the best expertise to address them. We also maintain a uh, technology neutral and vendor agnostic approach. That means, for instance, uh, we're not saying that blockchain will be the solution for everything as it depends on the use case. And most importantly, we believe in opening up access to standards and increasing adoption across the ecosystem. Uh, we strongly support capacity building uh, and translating knowledge into actionable training and education to enable more businesses to make the switch to paperless. And this is especially urgent uh, given the various disruptions felt across the logistics and supply chain sector, uh, as my previous um, uh, panelists have um, already talked about. So uh, recently I have uh, reflected on the lessons um, that I have learned uh, from my previous capacity, having worked at a large warehousing and freight forwarding logistic company until about six months ago, and to my present view at ICC, uh, which is the World Business Organization. So the first lesson that I think uh, we learned is that uh, despite the worst fears, uh, trade and supply chain has proved more resilient. And we have seen a lot in the examples uh, that have been excellently shown uh, by the previous panelists. Um, logistics and supply chain is definitely under a lot of pressure and the stress tests continue to be coming our way, but it's not broken. And thanks to the collective capacity to change uh, and pivot to digital, um, you know, uh, Logistics have actually enabled uh, many businesses to, a, to be able to maintain an online presence and even create new value. Uh, but as we have seen uh, a few times today in our panel, uh, we see that paper-based transactions uh, continue to dominate international trade, and it is a source of uh, additional costs, delay, and even fraud and error. So for instance, uh, when the original bills of lading are late to arrive um, at the port, for instance, uh, carriers would typically have to discharge um, based on a letter's identity, and there is uh, inherent risk in that. My second observation is that um, although the pace of digitization has picked up, um, adoption remains rather limited. Um, so for instance, in December last year, uh, the Digital Container Shipping Association, DCSA, released a statistic that estimate that only 0.1% of all bills of lading issuance are actually electronic. That means 99.9% .9 remains on paper. 
And this is after two decades of investments and efforts. So the irony is that um, there is no lack of solution providers who can actually help to digitize abuse of leading. But the problem is most of them do so in a closed loop environment uh, where there are specific definitions and terms and conditions uh, which apply to that environment itself, but not outside. And that remains in a highly fragmented situation where you know, a business would have to sign up to multiple platforms in order to connect to all of their suppliers, customers, and banks. And this is uh, extremely costly in terms of training and technical integration, and that is beyond reach um, to most of our businesses, especially our MSMEs. So the third observation uh, that we have is that um, there is a general, uh, general reluctance to embrace digital trade documents at scale, even though um, there could be uh, interest to experiment uh, with your know, proof of concepts and all that, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, people need legal certainty. For instance, uh, as an exporter, uh, he would want to know if the financing banks will be able to accept the digital bills of lading uh, or maybe electronic warehouse warrant um, as a letter of credit presentation. And vice versa, uh, importer wants to know if she will be able to clear customs smoothly with an electronic bills of lading. And let's say a dispute arises, then will these digital trade documents be able to stand in a courtroom situation? So there is no certain answer to all these questions, unfortunately, because of, of the updated regulations. And this has also been mentioned by a few speakers before. Um, so, you know, this is just one of the layers of complexity that businesses have to deal with on top of operating uh, in multiple jurisdictions, which comes with a constantly changing compliance and regulatory process. So in my view, um, the challenges ahead of us are threefold. Firstly, uh, we need governments uh, to actually step up with the necessary legislative reform um, to enable uh, digital title documents such as bills of lading, warehouse receipts, uh, et cetera, or what we call electronic transferable records are able to be legally recognized. And the solution exists in the form of the UNCITRAL model law on electronic transferable records or MLITER. And this enables the legal use of electronic transferable records, both domestically and across borders, once enacted into national legislation. So currently the, uh, currently the status is that we have five jurisdictions which have already enacted this model law, uh, being Bahrain, uh, Belize, Kiribati, Singapore, and uh, UAE um, in the Abu Dhabi general market. So the real question is who will be among the next 10 countries to do so? And a lot of hope is being pinned on the key trading nations and corridors such as the UK and the G7. There are also considerable interests in G20, um, APEC and ASEAN. So the challenge is how to accelerate this globally to enable the network effect to take place. And the second challenge uh, facing us, uh, I think, is how to harmonize among the standards that are already available, as well as those that are being produced uh, for specific use case and actors. Um, so again, we come back to the example of the EBS of lading. Um, we already have the DCSA EBL standard for containerized shipping. And earlier we hear about uh, FIATA's multimodal EBL being ready soon. Uh, we also know that uh, BIMCO is busy producing uh, the EBL standard for the dry and wet bulk sectors. Um, so the key thing is um, you know, all three organizations have been actively engaged uh, with one another and the wider business community including the ICC, to make sure that all these standards are actually compatible and interoperable. Uh, similarly, another example I can give you is um, identity, for instance, that's really important in the supply chain. And so the US Customs and Border is looking into a single identifier solution that will potentially combine um, the LEI, GS1, and DANS numbers, which are different standards for business identities in the supply chain. And the ultimate test for me um, as a third challenge would be interoperability between borders and stakeholders. And this again echoes uh, some of the sentiments that uh, previous panelists have mentioned. Uh, in this area, uh, ICC has championed um, the use of high level open source framework such as EuroRDTT and also uh, uh, ways in which technology can assist 
um, seamless data exchange, such as APIs or application programming interface. So what kind of policies would be helpful to address the challenges that we have just mentioned? I think the most urgent task at hand is to enable the legal recognition of electronic documents and signatures domestically and across borders. There is a clear pathway to get there. Uh, and ICC and UNCITRA would be really happy to work with any interested jurisdictions who wants to be the next to benefit from paperless trade. And beyond domestic borders, I think there is clear evidence uh, that the close coordination uh, between governments to come up with supportive policies would be highly beneficial. And uh, on the screen here, uh, we have seen a few examples of those, such as uh, the G7 collaboration framework to promote um, electronic transferable records, as well as uh, the UNSCAP framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific. And of course, um, the e-commerce JSI negotiations at the WTO is another example. I think last but not least, we would urge um, all policymakers to maintain regular consultation with the global business community to ensure that current and future policies remain fit for purpose and commercially viable in a cross-border digital environment. And examples of such uh, important issues are things like digital identity, how to uh, have the governance around flows of data, uh, and how to connect national and regional single windows with other platforms. So this is the end of my presentation, and I would like to highlight this publication that ICC released last month. It contains 27 recommendations from the global business community for the WTO on how to make modern trade rules work better for the people and planet, including how to address digitization challenges. It is a short document and freely available from ICC website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, now we are running out of time, and then I we do have uh, some questions. I'm going to uh, read these questions, and then um, I will invite each speaker uh, to answer uh, to answer whatever uh, which part of the question uh, you want. And uh, you will have each one one minute to uh, address the questions. Um, we have questions about uh, paperless trading. Okay, about um, um, I think. Um, the audience, they, they, they all note that the importance of uh, trade facilitation, pay, paperless trading, and then uh, TFA obligation on paperless trading um, is best, um, this is a, is a best practice, not obligation. But then to, uh, to make it an obligation, uh, that will have to uh, uh, be subject to dispute settlement, but then that some members may have concerns. So uh, how do you... Uh, uh, view this uh, problem. And then uh, we have some other questions about, um, yeah, this, uh, the importance of paperless trading, trade facilitation, and cross-border data flows. And then this uh, have been uh, recognized by all the speakers. But then how can the members of WTO uh, foster better progress in this area? And do we need to uh, think to more holistic and more um, horizontally instead of vertically along the pillars of the legal structure of the WTO legal uh, rule book? How can we cooperate better with stakeholders like WCO and the business represent representatives? How can we inspire stakeholders to give more technical assistance and the capacity building? Okay. And then the, these are the questions. So, um, uh, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, the speakers uh, to answer the answer the answer the questions. Um, I, I notice Carlo, you want to address uh, probably the first one. Carlo, please. Yeah, I am happy. Thank you, Rosie, and thank you for the question. I, I it was probably my intervention that triggered it. And when I mentioned that the the the, the paid facilitation agreements uh, articles on that speak about digitalization are best endeavors and they should be treated as obligations. I was not implying, and perhaps that was a wrong choice of words, that we should renegotiate the treaty or, or, or change the nature of those articles, not far from that. Uh, what I'm talking about is the level of ambition in, in the implementation. In 2015, 2016, when this was adopted, uh, clearly that was seen as something complex and people wanted some, some wiggle room. Uh, that's why you put in um, 
our best endeavors uh, uh, clause in, in, in the article. But the pandemic has shown how critically vital this is. Uh, and, and like I said, it's a proof of concept. So uh, rather than talking about which kind of legal obligation is it or not, what I'm saying is this gives you uh, as a signatory an aspirational goal. Make sure that you reach it. Uh, make, make sure that you uh, ask for the necessary technical uh, or financial assistance that's available under the treaty to turn your borders into digital borders in a way that the treaty sets, albeit just as an aspirational goal. That's that's what I mean, what I intended to say. And the resources are available there. We have the goals. Let's use them as benchmarks and make sure that the level of ambition and the speed with which this is implemented is increased. I hope to have answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. And how about other um, speakers um, want to address those questions? Uh, I think there's one for probably for Gula. Um, yeah, there's a, a question. I think there's a member from your association. Um, he wants to know um, how to initiate the digitalization process. The question is, you know, where to start? I, I think I, I, my understanding is that, you know, um, SMAEs, a lot of MS, MS, your, your mem the members of your, your association, they are SMAEs, and they do have, they don't have, you know, sort of um, uh, financial capacity to initiate the digitalization process. And then so uh, where, you know, how they can start the process if it's necessary, and then whether that is, uh, I don't know whether you want to answer that question. Oh, thank you, Rosie. That's a, that's a fair question, actually. And that was kind of one of the obstacles or challenges to be addressed at the beginning. Because once you, once you want to have this uh, ambitious project of having this umbrella digital roof uh, on top of all, uh, all members of, share, of, of all shareholders of the logistics industry, the, uh, the, the ownership of the project is quite uh, important because that kind of also uh, means that uh, that kind of sets the uh, the interaction between the state because it's usually uh, if it's a private uh, uh, organization the state may have their own uh, uh, distance towards such initiatives. So that was kind of, uh, and in, in, in Turkish case, in our uh, platform, the ownership is, uh, is, a, is a question to be answered actually. And of course it needs finance, it needs resources, it needs capacity. And because as, I've, as I have told you, it's a, it's a project, it's an ongoing project. Uh, it, things, good look on, good, things, good, uh, things look good on paper. But the ownership and financing the process and uh, all other uh, issues uh, related to this need still uh, be answered. So the starting point was that once we have this uh, the concept and the, uh, once we have this report, that should set the ideal, especially after a post-COVID period. So this report we have prepared, and this, uh, the, the idea of a logistics platform is to set the ideal. What once, how it's going to be uh, executed comes with many questions as such, like who is going to actually run it? Who is going to finance it? And that, I should say, also remains as a challenge uh, in front of us in, 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 in the future for the proper execution of this project. I hope this has been uh, clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, panelists who want to uh, intervene. Uh, I think we will start with uh, MGAT and then Hannah and um, uh, Dr. Graber, please. Okay, uh, MGAT. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, Sure. I'll, uh, my two cents worth are, first of all, I loved uh, Hannah's presentation and I'll just point to it because the question was, how do we 
have the WTO interact more with the private sector. And there was an example um, in Hannah's presentation really of how the ICC distilled many work streams out in the private sector industry in regards to going digital, um, both from a standard standpoint and accessibility standpoint. So one of the, my uh, pet peeves is there aren't really that many mechanisms at the WTO for the private sector to on-ramp um, other than doing some informal sessions during lunch hours. Um, that's really what we're able to do. There is one exception and that's what I wanted to highlight. And that is within the WTO uh, trade facilitation agreement, there are TFA committees that are set up in each country. So it's the obligation of the countries to set up the TFA committee. And then there's a, the master TFA committee at the WTO. We've had the privilege of presenting that committee and they welcomed us with open arms, um, which is great. And I think from a private sector standpoint, what we really need to do is be able to have a seat at the table at these committees, A, in countries, and B, how do you cross-pollinate the TFA committee at the WTO and synergize it with the TFA committees that are in country that are implementing all of these articles and provisions. Because as you heard over and over and over and over and over again, patchwork doesn't work. And the intention of the WTO TFA was to create mutual recognition, synchronicity, and a high level of ambition. And post COVID, that's really what we want the WTO to lean in on and countries to actually execute on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hannah, please. Hannah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, provide my two cents worth to Eric Sonberg's question uh, regarding the need to think more holistically and more horizontally. I think this is approach that we have also uh, um, adopted and we have seen results. So for instance, uh, in the past two months, we have constructed an industry advisory board for the DSI uh, because we believe that in order to have that interoperability, uh, that holy grail that we're all after, we need to have perspectives and uh, consensus from all actors along the supply chain. Uh, so for that reason, we have assembled a group of about 20 uh, senior leaders uh, from both the public and private sector. Uh, so we have uh, people from uh, the um, ports and logistics, we have uh, carriers, we have people at DCSA, FIATA, BIMCO, uh, IPCSA, uh, we have uh, people who actually import and export goods uh, from commodities to retail players. Uh, we have banks, uh, insurance players, and also, uh, for example, the WCO is also at the table. So the whole uh, point of doing that is, again, um, latching on that uh, horizontal thinking, making sure that uh, something that works for one part of the supply chain should also work for another part of the supply chain uh, for both the physical and uh, financial flow uh, as well as the digital uh, data flows. So there's something that we have adopted as an approach, and I think this is a good approach to follow uh, in terms of thinking about solving some of the challenges that we have discussed. Thank you. Hannah. Okay, uh, Dr. Graber, you have the last word, please. Thank you very much. That's a heavy responsibility. But I, I would like to come back and, uh, to the listening question also. Uh, we, we are dealing with a lot of SMEs at FIATA uh, in the freight forwarding industry in our membership. And I think what is important is trying to, to, to stay pragmatic. We will not be able to solve everything at, the, at one time. Uh, we need to really address by small steps where there are inefficiencies in the, in, the, in the supply chain and how here we can, as an association, and the official brings some solutions to address it. And I think there are a lot of things that exist today. So uh, as it was said during this meeting, uh, there are tools present. And if I now turn to, to our audience today, I think and it was uh, very well also uh, underlined by uh, in the presentation. We have this MLTR uh, that exists that needs absolutely its adoption to be accelerated. So let's start with that instead of trying to, to construct very, very complicated things, how can we accelerate the adoption of the MLTR? How can we uh, remove some uh, obstacles to the use of electronic transferable records? So I think if we manage to, to be pragmatic and really looking at some areas where we have solution today, where we have an approach that can work, let's try to, 
to work on their implementation and adoption quickly so that we can make good things and it will help the supply chain. It will also help uh, the companies and the SMEs then to see that it brings something to their day to day. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Graber. I think we have already run out of time. Um, I have to uh, conclude this uh, webinar. Um, we had a very uh, informative and inspiring uh, event today. Uh, I think we have learned a lot from business and I think very rich presentation. Um, you know, uh, I have been uh, working in this organization uh, nearly 20 years. To my knowledge, this is the first time we organize an event dedicated to uh, logistic services, despite uh, the critical role of logistic services in trade. I hope there will be more opportunities to discuss logistic services and have a better understanding of this uh, strategically important uh, sector, uh, especially when the sector is, uh, uh, is being transformed and upgraded uh, to digitalization. Uh, with this, I want to um, thank again all our speakers and uh, I want to conclude this uh, webinar. Thank you for uh, thank you all for listening and for your participation. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.